and death shall have no dominion. Dead men naked they shall be one, with the man in the wind and the west moon, when their bones are picked clean and the clean bones gone. They shall have stars at elbow and foot. Though they go mad, they shall be sane. Though they sink, though the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. Good afternoon, Doris, or Dolly, I should say. Hi, Rob. It's nice to hear you. Serious My... topic, I guess, we have today. Well, you're the one that suggested it, so I'm drinking a little wine today in honor of that. Okay. So, so me, a glass of water. So okay, let's water see. and wine. But this is a topic that you suggested uh, when we first started talking about doing this this uh, episode or these podcasts. And I've been thinking a lot about this topic. I have been because in discussion with my mother, I was talking about death. And from my perspective, is death has always been in another room for me. Death has never really been, well, that's just, that's, okay, let me first preface is saying death of others has always been in another room. For instance, when it came to my, my mother's father, I only met him twice, and after that, he was dead. All I remember of him was a man who had a strange mustache. He smelled really bad of cigars and whiskey, and he had terrible peanut butter. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently when he passed over, they had found him three days later. He was on a heating pad, so his body, after decomposition was it was quite an aroma in his uh, retirement village i didn't go to the funeral i, I only remember the the will the, for instance the executor coming over discussing the will other than that when my opa my father's father passed over i didn't see him in the hospital my father always said it was a good thing you did not see him in the hospital because he was so withered he was a skeleton and my last memory of him was valentine's day 1997 my cousin and I had a, a spare morning. We were basically assigned to do a, a independent projects, so we were given two hours to go off on our own. And what we did is we used that time to go visit my opa, and I'm glad we did. We picked up some donuts and we walked over, and he was sitting there. My aunts were there, and my my grandmother, my oma. And at one point, when no one else was in the room, my opa, who was sitting across from me wearing his blue pajamas, and he was still. He looked okay at the time, but you could tell he had lost a little bit of weight. He was wearing his blue pajamas. He had his cryptic crosswords, which he loved to do. And he he stared at me, and it was just this odd moment. He was just looking at me as if taking me in. And it was for the last time, because the next time I was supposed to see him, I was working at my uncle's greenhouse, and my cousin, my cousin Mike, walked in, and he said, Opa's dead. We had our break. We had a moment of silence. And interesting enough, when my Oma died, I wasn't there. And then my cousin Mike, he died around this time, actually Christmas, a couple of days before Christmas in 2010. He worked for his father in the greenhouse, and he died of a virus of the heart. His heart stopped, uh, they say, around 2 o'clock in the morning. So his death, interestingly enough, is the closest I've seen. I actually, it was the first time I saw an actual cadaver, a body on display. And it's very interesting. In Germany, you say public viewing, and I know public viewing is for a sports occasion. You watch a football match, Bayern Munich against Leipzig, Arbe. For us, a public viewing is when we have an opportunity to see the body. For instance, if I cannot attend a funeral, I have an opportunity to pay respects. So I know in, in Germany you'd say, meine Mitgefühl, so my condolences. And that occasion, it stays with me because when I learned my cousin died, it was a shock. I mean, here's a 30, 38 year old man, prime of his life. He just had a really bad cold as far as we knew, and he passed over. And when we arrived there, there was my uncle, very quiet, my aunt. We shook hands, we hugged. There was my cousin, Jeff, the, the middle brother, my cousin, Rob, the younger. And there was a quiet woman, and then there was this sobbing woman. And I thought the sobbing woman was my cousin's fiance, my cousin Mike's fiance. So I held her and hugged her and said, it's going to be okay. It's only moments later that my brother said, that's your cousin, your other cousin's wife. So the woman, the fiance, 
she was quiet. She she wasn't sobbing. She wasn't giving in to hysteria. She wasn't giving in to that 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 unbearable grief. She was very stoic. And it was very remarkable that when she delivered the eulogy, it was more from a place of appreciation. For instance, my cousin Rob, my cousin Jeff, they couldn't hold back the tears. Whereas my cousin Mike, he was stoic, and I don't know how he would be. But his fiance, she got up on there out of, at the front to deliver the eulogy. And she just told a wonderful story about my cousin, how he loved talking with her parents. Her parents are Russian and what he learned about after the war, coming to Canada. He loved maps. He loved globes. He loved learning about history. So he loved the Russian history. And she just delivered this beautiful eulogy about this human being that came into her life, how much she appreciated his presence and his passing over. So that's that's the closest I've been to death, I mean, in terms of seeing the body. And I, I turn it over to you because, I, I mean, this is a topic that you want to discuss, and perhaps you can tell our listeners or viewers why you want to discuss it. And you is, look so lovely with your camera today. <laughs> Thank you very much. The thing is, um, I had the feeling that there is magic attached to death, and mm -hmm. you said that uh, he had a certain look. Yes, the, the last time you, you saw. Uh, that yeah, my man. opa. Yes. And uh, so there's, people say that before people die, they have a certain premonition of what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, they they... This is the magic moment for me because I always want to catch it. I want to be there when that moment happens. And um, my mom has been ill, very ill for so many years so that I wondered if that moment hadn't arrived yet. So I'm mm -hmm. still wanting to say goodbye to her in the correct moment because I learned that before people die, they have a merry moment and they seem stronger um, and let go of all the hardship they have uh, suffered from. But that moment has not yet arrived yet and I have to suffer all those years. <laughs> so this is, um, this is something I'm waiting for, that magic, because when people are very ill, the suffering is so long, even for the, re for the relatives and even more for the relatives. And the second thing is that when a person has died, the reaction of uh, of the woman being stoic about it is is uh, like taking in advance what happens later, the steps of uh, mourning. And mm -hmm. I guess she has overcome some steps like anger, non-belief, grief. And grief and then uh, getting to terms with it and she some people are able to do those steps earlier than others and mm -hmm. mix them up and I have a feeling that she had such had gone such steps yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the right. reason why I wanted to talk about death is um, people uh, believe in afterlife uh, people have to make sense out of death and there are a lot of people out there who believe that everything falls into pieces and uh, nothing remains of the people just ashes and I always ask them what they believe and this is important for me so that I can get on with them that I can't change it. I, I don't want to change it. I accept it. But I think it's important when people meet for the first time, they should also ask, what do you believe will happen once you are dying or you have died? So my question to you is, what do you believe, Rob? Well, I believe in an afterlife, but I also believe in reincarnation. I would suppose that, like many people, uh, there is this tunnel of white light and of course on that path into the afterlife we meet the ones that have passed over waiting for us 
the idea that when we pass over, we're surrounded by love, light, angels, maybe a family pet that we love so much. Something will be there. Someone, a crowd will be there to welcome us. Um, that's that's simply my belief in that in many ways when we pass over, we will have a chance to investigate or return to our lives these certain significant moments that in many ways, I, I don't know if death would actually be completely final in that moment. My fantasy is that when you go into the afterlife, you can find yourself perhaps in an opportunity to go back into certain moments in your life, to investigate them, to to feel them once more, perhaps to, to, to get some information from that, from that moment to experience. Because I think, I, I don't know, I think it would be a robbing us of the opportunity of learning something if we don't have that chance. So that's, that's a dream of mine. I mean, the, 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 the writer, sorry, go on. Many people in Hinduism believe in that and mm -hmm. they have, they believe in karma and uh, yes. that, they they have a good feeling when they do something right in their opinion or in other people's opinion so that they go into circles yes until they have finally reached uh, uh, their destination of mm -hmm. life circling and i i like the idea of doing something better but i don't like the idea of having to return to the same uh surrounding I would prefer going into a different setting as I have always done in life. So I don't want to go into the setting and do it right this time. I don't want to do that. I want to decide in different settings, new new ideas. I want to develop myself. Mm -hmm. So this would I, be not my case. I would just love to revisit certain moments in my past just to just be there for a few <laughs> moments. Why not? There's there's some beautiful, I mean, Nietzsche always talked about that beautiful moment, you know, that we would say yes to life everlasting, to certain grueling moments in life if there was one beautiful moment. And I think the beautiful moment is very attractive for me. And I would love to revisit certain certain moments in my life just to see and just to, just to feel it once more, I, I guess this... it would be, you know, listening to a piece of music one last time. Like the, mm. the, uh, the author Borges talked about, there's a poem of his where he talks about being able to basically say, there's like one door I will never go back to. There's one passage in a book I'll never return to. And I, I want to return to those passages. I want to return to that door, to that place. It's a Funny. fantasy of mine. Did you, okay. did you ever say goodbye then? To my opa? No, I mean to all these wishes, to these moments you want to return did you ever well, say goodbye this. well when i write that's my way of saying goodbye mm -hmm. in case that there will not be an opportunity to revisit in the meantime uh, let me investigate let me take these moments or you know, the crystals and crystallize them into a piece of work a piece of art so I cannot wait till the end of my life to find out if I'll revisit. In the meantime, I'd like to take those moments, the fragments I have in my memory, and patch them together in this sort of sort of mosaic. And that's that's what I did with my with my opa, for instance, the character of Anna, when her geo passes over. In many ways, it was me as Anna. So Anna is my soul somewhere else. That's how I look at her. So her opportunity to say goodbye was not my opportunity. Oh, so then I would love to hear it. Okay. And this takes place when she's around six, seven years old. So this is one mm -hmm. of the early stories in my collection. And the the context is that she has woken up in the middle of the night. There's a thunderstorm. And as a child, I was always rattled by the thunder. So I would go rushing to my parents' room and my dad would place me in the bed between him and my mother and slowly but surely I would fall asleep. So Anna does the same thing. Her father's awake. Interesting enough, uh, the mother is the heavy snorer. So I have to, yeah, I have to say that this is very much a very personal thing, but also it's, I feel like it's universal. Mm -hmm. And this sort of describes what the moment that I never had with my Opa. So I'll read that now. Okay. After, after New Year's, as she gets out of her mother's car, the flakes twirl in front of Anna's face. Corolla has brought her two daughters to an old brick building standing near the lake. 
Here there are people old as her grandfather in so many drab, stifling rooms. Some sit in a common area with tables and they play cards or with gnarled fists against cheeks, watch TV, mouths hanging open. Mostly everyone has a room, and in those rooms, tubes, machines, and plastic bags surrounding the sleeping bodies. Some of the bodies wear masks. At the end of one hall, the rooms smell like old carpets and worn school radiators, heated steel and dust. Thunder, you have to go. Time for you to leave, because, because that's enough. Raising her chest, she feels more like the one across the hall, and yes, thunder. Time for you to skedaddle. Don't forget to take your hat and wave goodbye. The thunder is like an unwelcome guest or lost saint at the door. His father's breath is like his heartbeat. Thunder, you can't have everything. Her cheeks are warm, the warm inside. Rain is on her cheeks. Geo somewhere on the inside, where the inside can return as much as it wants, but not fully. The inside with its pieces, the pieces where he is in bed under his light blue blanket. There are people always near him. In February, she has brought a large red heart, Valentine's Day. Holding the card, he holds a stick with a button at the end of it. Tears slide down into the mask, but they can't get into his mouth. He hums a song, and Nona nearby hums along, as if in duet. There are more hugs like this, so many during March break, and the last one on Easter Sunday. A hug, but not really, because each time the mask rubs against Anna's shoulder. And each time, she feels afraid that he, Gio, might break in her small embrace. Where are the sturdy arms? Anna's mother continually reassures her, no, no, he cannot break, and if he does, someone will be there. They must come to help. Each time a hand holds on for as long as it can, deep breathing, no singing. During Easter, another long hug that Anna wants to keep around her heart forever, but she has to let go. Has to, and looking at him, she wishes the strangers from the story will come and help him. The room is warm, but it feels sad. The arms are no longer strong. The blue eyes shine. Papa, Ancha, bye-bye. So it's a small passage, and Papa is bye-bye in Czech. So that's his background. Thank you very much. Thank it you. is like, um, this is like, a, for me, it's like a convergence of uh, human and nature. Um, Interesting, okay. This passage like, I wrote. Yes, it is like okay. the, the thunderstorm um, it is envied because okay. the nature can do what it wants and it comes and robs you of life and vanishes again. It decides to be your friend or your enemy. You can mm -hmm. not do anything against it. It is the observer of your emotions. It is like telling the story from from the thunderstorm's perspective. I like that very much. And the thunderstorm is like a character because as a child, that's how I imagine the thunder is this sort of ghoulish boogeyman, this character. And the birds, for instance, the sound of rain on the roof sounds like angry birds. I know that there's a video game, Angry Birds. And as a child, I was always afraid of the movie, The Birds, by Alfred Hitchcock, just the idea of this, Me too. this flock that would attack. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Getting into I, the Again, house. when I, I was, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> when I was six years old, I remember I was, we were at a family friend's place and the birds was on TV and I, I couldn't watch it. Like it, it scared me. I was, again, the age that Anna is. So that's why I put that connotation earlier on in that, that story. Mm -hmm. But these moments, again, these sort of, these, these fragmented moments from my life, I've, patched together to create this this story so and death is it's the first story in many ways in the collection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i i feel and i agree with heidegger that in many ways philosophy is our preparation for death and i think that literature is the same thing the literature so many stories end in death so many operas end in death so many great arias are just before the character dies there's this like it's like in wagner the Liebestod, this climax and it's very funny that the French, you know, they, they, they have this connotation of like the, the le petit mort, which is orgasm. So life and death in that context. I always uh, went to say goodbye to places or to moments in my life. Mm -hmm. So I learned when being a child 
of uh, how it feels to 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 die because you have so many little deaths in your life and i learned to love it so when i went to tallinn in estonia as a child oh beautiful with, city i hear with school and um, okay. i really enjoyed it there i fell in love with a little boy on the train oh. to moscow and um when we came out of the train it was already over but it was the nicest journey <laughs> at mm-hmm. that age so we went in a whole big group there and after very exciting days i said goodbye to that town and ever since i repeated that gesture so whenever i have to change places in life i say goodbye and this is really something that I love, I enjoy because it gives every every departure a very nice and positive touch. Yes. I like that. I really like that. It's almost like the, the eulogy for moments and places and towns and and it's it's very interesting because yes, there are many deaths and when I was a teacher I could always feel that okay, it's coming to the end with this student, it's coming to the end with this group of students. But I always liked that there was always this one sort of final moment with that student even though i felt like there was a goodbye there would be still another moment where i'd see them out of nowhere and i just it felt like handshake see you later merry christmas at certain points and i i really i really like that i the idea of having these sort of little yeah eulogies to places and people i mean we we have death in every yeah every context as you're saying um i have i have trouble writing about it to be honest so okay. I love to write when I'm in conflict, yes. But I mm. cannot write when somebody is dying. This is not very productive for me. This is mm. like going back into the corner, yes, and uh, not being productive. It's impossible for me. So I can't imagine doing music like Wa- Wa- Wagner did. I'm sorry, Wagner, Wagner. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> English and German. <laughs> Mixed I know it's I have moments I, sometimes the German word comes I've been here so long the German word comes first in some things because I don't use the English words anymore yes that's right so I think like Treppenhaus. Uh, it, is, <laughs> Treppenhaus. it is a metaphor for death yes I I mm. don't think that he really touched death and made that wonderful music I more think that he thought about love and then made that music so this is my very personal idea. And, well, um, and yeah, I think the romantics are in love with graveyards. When you think of, you know, especially like, for instance, behind me is Caspar David Friedrich, his mm-hmm. painting of, of uh, the scenes, the ruins of an abbey, you know, grave markers, the whole romantic movement was, it was, it was in love with the Gothic. And it was this love of the mortuary, the love of death, the love of cemeteries. You think about Chopin's funeral march. You think about Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique, where the fourth movement is basically an execution, and he's in the underworld after that. <laughs> yes, and I believe uh, that Shelley, when he had his last months in Italy, um, just before he drowned in the ocean, he had a look at the sea in uh, mm-hmm. near Naples, and uh, he he wrote wonderful poems about the mm-hmm. ocean and about life and death, etc. And it was like he encompassed uh, nature and loved death. And a couple of weeks later, he died. It is, I think, it is the absence of meaning that, especially romantic poets searched for meaning in life in nature because they didn't feel that life the actual life surrounding them was giving them anything so they searched for meaning in nature and Mm -hmm. their ideas was their life so once that stopped because Shelley after months with his wife he wanted to go back to London but I guess he feared to go back because nothing was there, nothing meaningful. That's why he drowned. It's, mm-hmm. it's for me, is is very simple. And before yeah, he died, find... oh. 
he he visited the graves uh, of other uh, poets who had died recently. I mean, it's not just Shelley who died, but um, other romantic poets too. We talked about that one. What's his name? Uh, who died? John in, Keats. In, yeah, Keats. That's right. Yes. And I was about to talk about him because I always find it very fascinating. I, I love the film uh, Bright Star made by the same director as the, the piano, Jane Campion, I believe that's her name. And reading his biography after seeing the film, and it was really fascinating because he had tuberculosis, like many of his family members who died of, perished of tuberculosis. He made the decision to leave the woman he loved, Fanny Brown, and go to Rome, to go to Italy, you know, the warmer climates. That was the recommendation in those days. I found it very fascinating because when he left the ship initially was, you know, it was initially destined to head off into the great blue yonder, head down, go into the Mediterranean, but it stopped for a little while. It stopped in England because I, be, I believe because of storms. So for a moment in time, Keats, he was on this ship and he walked around, he got off the ship and he was still in England, even though he had already said goodbye, he had not yet fully said goodbye. And he actually, he had this opportunity to go back to Fanny Brown, but he didn't. He just stayed on the ship, and then they set sail. And I always think that was fascinating because there was this one last chance because he was going to die, but he he died alone, basically, in a, an Italian city in Rome, away from family and friends. The inevitable was going to happen. And what's the result is that the Spanish steps in Rome are now famous because in mm -hmm. one of these apartments, Keats... Yes, I've been there. Mm -hmm. But it, it's 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 to me it's unfortunate because he you either had the choice to be with Fanny and stay with her, or die in some place that now is just famous because he died there. Mm -hmm. Goethe didn't die. I mean, when he went away from Charlotte von Stein, mm -hmm. um, he went to his uh, big journey to to Italy, and he yeah. he hardly ever wanted to come back. And once he came back, he said goodbye to Charlotte and married uh, his later wife. So Goethe, re really, he, he lived in a certain, only a few years later. But mm -hmm. he was a different, completely different character because he was, um, he had a, a great job in Weimar. And he had so many different tasks, um, not just writing, that he was very interested in daily life affairs, that mm -hmm. he loved to talk to people and listened to, to students who came and uh, told him their ideas. So the mm -hmm. contrast to the romantic poets was that um, it is a different way of being in life, of, of standing, of having a standing. So mm -hmm. Goethe, uh, I could never have imagined him uh, committing suicide or something like that. Never. No. And yet his, his famous friend Schiller died very young compared to Goethe. I mean, Schiller yes. was still closer to middle age. And it's very interesting. When I was in Weimar, I visited Weimar in 2018, I found the Schiller house more of a family house. It's warmer. It felt like you... You could feel in the floorboards that there was this presence there. And yet you go to the Goethe house and it's all marble statues and art. It feels like such a contrast because you have these two different human beings. Goethe, I think, was in love with antiquity. He was in love with the ancient world. And that's fine. But when you walk around his house, all you feel like you're in the presence of an art collector. And yes, he, he was a multifaceted man. He was a Renaissance man. He was a man of different skills, abilities, interests. And Schiller, you go to his home and you know there was children there running across the floorboards. You can feel that that childlike. And he was very much fascinated with the sentimental, with the naive. He felt like the child was closer into nature. The same thing with the, the romantic painter Runga. He believed that children were closer to God, closer to source, to heaven. And he often painted scenes and where you see the children holding flowers and flowers like the sunflower, the sunflower closest to the divine God. And when he depicted men and women like his parents in these pictures, they looked old. They looked worn by life. 
so coming like with Schiller, I, I find it was very fascinating that even though he he died younger, there was so much life in his world. There was not so much the marble that Goethe had. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, this is my would you so. would would you agree that everybody dies on his own? I mean, regardless uh, the success they had in life, the last hours or weeks are very very isolated i don't know like what's the what's the idea of alone like is this a loneliness or alone like for instance there's solitude which is like the pleasure of being alone i i love solitude and mm. then there's loneliness which is like the isolation there's this really beautiful quote i love by jose saramago who won the nobel prize a portuguese writer and he wrote in one of his books that loneliness it's not so much the tree in the distance standing alone but it's within the tree the distance between the bark and the sap so you can be alone but loneliness the horrible kind of loneliness is when you feel alone inside yourself yes it's the absence of duties it's the absence of friends is the absence yes. of being uh, necessary in society um, yeah, and it's uh, is is having the illness. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and exactly. the pain, and illness, pain, and loneliness together can be very hard. Yes, mm. it's desperation. Yes, I think about like Tolstoy's story, the death of even Ilyich, mm -hmm. and what you felt when I I reread that story not too long ago. I felt with his story that this man, he was in many ways already dying before he was dying. He had a loveless marriage. He never felt a connection with his, his own career path, his own profession. And in many ways, I can kind of relate because I mentioned earlier as we were beginning that although with others, I felt death was something in another room with myself during my years of illness, which I, I talk about in my on my podcast from thejawsaligned.com that when I was sick, I was basically on the edge of death, even though because I was so stubborn, I was wearing these stubborn blinders. I was so careless. I was on this tightrope walk and I didn't even know I was doing it. And it was only because of my stepfather. He actually dragged me into a doctor's office in 2003. This was November. The doctor did blood tests and my blood was super low. Like normally it's around with a healthy male at the age of 20, you know, 23 at the time, it should be like 17, 15 point, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was 4.3. Oh my God. And mm -hmm. the doctor said when he got the results, he had to look at it again because he said, you came, you walked into my office. He said, someone with that low blood count, I would expect they would crawl into my office. So I was put on iron pills and then later I had iron injections and inevitably I, I would have the year following uh, three pints of blood put into me. This was in November 2004. But I, stubborn as I was, I, I kept going. And again, 2003, I was on the cusp because the doctor said, he said, any moment you could have a heart attack because your blood's so low. So to me, it's almost like death was this other reality and I was living kind of a stubborn fantasy of how I want things to be. Mm -hmm. And did you change anything then? Oh, of course. I, I had to change my love. I love uh, Rilke who said, du musst dein Leben ändern. You must change your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had to change my life. I had to change my attitudes. I had to change my perspective. I, not so much diet. I, I truly believe that it's the attitude, your mindset. For instance, mm -hmm. when I was learning about illness, there's uh, Dr. Andrew Weil in his book, Spontaneous Healing, and numerous other books. And from Spontaneous Healing described a woman with a split personality. So these two personalities were different how they could be distinguished is that one personality was allergic to strawberries. So you have one body, two personalities, so two different mindsets, really. So personality A could eat strawberries, personality B. So it made me realize it's all in the mind. It's the power of the thinking and thoughts. Yeah, it's very easy not... to say, but it's very hard to do. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, being ill, I recognize that people who become ill uh, concentrate on themselves yes, and then comes another step which is they are able after they have accepted their illness they are able to feel with others 
and change perspectives. Mm -hmm. They are able to see how other people see themselves. And then comes the healing process. They open up. Yes. Um, and that, That's me. That's me. that goes along with existential changes and with accepting fear into your letting fear enter your body, washing through your body and let it go. But this mm -hmm. takes a long while. It's very yes. hard. And, and it's very true. The, there's, there's an infatuation. When you're ill, you're infatuated with the illness. It's like self-absorption, but it's almost dark, derelict self-absorption. And that's what I had. It was only my mother. So I had a, a moment of reconciliation with my father in 2004. He came out to, to visit me when I was very, very ill, but I was, on the, I was recovering. So we had like this father-son moment, which was really remarkable. He told me things about his childhood. He opened up, and I, I finally saw him more as this human being as opposed to this distant giant. But the second healing came, and this major healing came when I returned to school, and I was starting to fall apart. I was starting to feel sick again. And my, my mother, first of all, she said, you have to get off the medication. Prednisone is a steroid. I was taking it, and it was making mm -hmm. me emotionally vulnerable. Like, to the point, if I, if I heard a Celine Dion song, I would cry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like that's how vulnerable and desperate i felt secondly she said you're using the illness you're being self-absorbed and you're not focusing on others you're not concentrating on being with them yes. be with people don't mm -hmm. and she said don't hide your light under a bushel the, the, from the from the bible so being with people all of a sudden taking this focus outside taking out this anger and worry and pain and frustration and just being open to others produces huge shift in my life and in many ways, it was like this death of that old, arrogant, egotistical self and, and a rebirth. I think... Um, so what you said. Yes, I agree. And um, when parents get old, yes, well, I'm in, in that age, um, it is well, like... you not old. You're lovely. <laughs> Thank you. But, I mean, being with my dad, yes, I always struggled with him as everybody else does. And yeah. I love the slow motion of dying because okay. it is like being able to, without any pressure, no expectations, is just being together, just sitting together, mostly eating and not even the conversation is great, but it is this feeling of absolute honesty towards each other. No hiding mm -hmm. necessary. And yeah. this is the slow motion of death, but it is so much important to have that. And I hear from people who say the best moments with my parents or with whoever older person mostly died was mm -hmm. months before their death so there's Always. also something enjoyable in it in the process of saying goodbye to each other the appreciation the significance yes i mean i mean how many times in our in our daily life do we actually stop and really enjoy something just a insignificant moment Yet it's significant, you know, watching a little boy with his father riding their bike down the street and, you know, the, the, the little boy calling out, you know, vata, vata, wait, papa, wait. I mean, I think those are beautiful moments or just sitting beside a river somewhere or again, savoring wine. Mm -hmm. That's right. Or, but only the first I, class. <laughs> this is the second, I believe. <laughs> oh, that's why you said good afternoon. <laughs> Seven in well, the it was after no, I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's okay. But I mean, yeah. there's the expression in English to kill the bottle, so death to mm -hmm. the bottle. <laughs> mm -hmm. So here we go. <laughs> here we go. Yes, but I mean, wine is uh, when you think about well, with the you know, the what is it in, in not a Catholic, but you know, drinking, drinking the wine is basically Jesus's hemoglobin, that's the concept, you know, the wafer mm -hmm. is his body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's the connotation there, especially when you think of Jesus and you think of Dionysus, you know, wine plays a huge role in their lives. And it's only through Jesus's death that there is this 
uh, rehabilitation of the world, this this sa- salvation, mm-hmm. this this path. So mm-hmm. I think his oh. his death in many ways is rebirth. It's it's life again, and he his his life was a rebellion against the old, the old you know the death to the old, rebirth of the new. But unfortunately, there was so much death and martyrdom in Christianity. There's so many saints that have horrible deaths that are depicted by Renaissance and Baroque masters. They're they're quite graphic. <laughs> Go on, sorry. <laughs> you know, redemption, etc. So many people, yes. when when their dog, for instance, dies, and you go mm-hmm. on Facebook and people post the death of their beloved dog, the most sweetest consolidations follow. 300, at least, with rainbows, yes. etc. And pause, very sweet remarks. It's like a community helping and supporting each other. It's lovely. Yes. Mm-hmm. But it only happens because the person who mourns the death goes out and says he or she is sad. If she didn't do it, she would be completely alone. So I think going public is very important Mm -hmm. for for people who who mourn. Mm -hmm. So don't go into the corner and lie on the sofa. You can do that, of course but not Mm -hmm. all day. No. So you have to organize support. And uh, I don't know what it's like in Germany and Europe, but in North America, there's always this, this negation or this denial of death. Because when you think about, for instance, when my cousin passed over, they they filled his body with formaldehyde. There was a public viewing you could see. And those were techniques and scientific measures used during the civil war. So many of these boys, these young men were killed and slaughtered, places like Gettysburg. Their parents, their loved one, want to see them again. So this is when embalming was first introduced. It was, again, allowing these people to have one last goodbye. And it was only until like the 1950s and 60s did we start to see books that started talking about death and opening it up. Because for us, I think in North America, death is still something very difficult for people to handle. And that's why we have the embalming. And there was a wonderful television series I always I've watched several times called Six Feet Under. And I must say that as much as it talked about the themes of death in a very careful and kind way, there are moments of humor. I mean, we we talk I, I believe the last time we talked, we talked about jokes and death is something that appears in jokes. And I, I told you about uh the Newfoundland mm-hmm. and the fishermen mm-hmm. or the, the police. I probably have to tell the joke in another context, but I'm just saying that there is humor. Mm-hmm. And that show, one of my favorite, for instance, the show Six Feet Under, always began with a death. And that death would either be pivotal to that episode's story, either as part of the character's development, the reflection on their life, or it would be like a side note. And my favorite episode is when Santa Claus, as a motorcyclist, gets hit and killed. So here's this big guy, begins the episode. He's in love with his motorcycle mama. He's going to go off and do his, his work as a Santa at the local mall. He's on the way. He's on his Harley, not wearing a helmet. Or no, he was wearing a helmet. All these kids see him. They wave, hey, Santa. Santa on the motorbike goes riding by. Ho, ho, ho. Next thing you see the kids and... And then the helmet comes rolling up to them. (laughs) So there's that element of humor there because, you know, (laughs) they killed Santa. So you know, we talked yeah. about humor in the past, you and I in a personal discussion. So black humor is part of my humor. It is. So and so and the show embraces that. <laughs> so I love it. Yes. And what I love is in, in Japan or in Korea or wherever in Asia, uh, they celebrate the deaths of the people mm-hmm. years after. They commemorate mm-hmm. it and they yes. put their loved food uh, mm-hmm. In front of a, how do you call that? Altar. The altar. And it's like people coming and bowing and sitting and talking, having a candle. I like that yes. very much. I always ask myself, oh, what a waste of food. But it is very symbolic and this symbol I love. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
but that's that's the mindset that we have we we have a culture that it doesn't really believe in the rituals and the symbolic we have a culture of practice it's very it's very practical culture which i think is very uncomfortable for for the spiritual part of ourselves i think human beings we we always judge ourselves based on money hours what's in our bank account our accomplishments and yet we never really consider our emotional health or the health of the people around us in terms of their emotions. It seems like we're always looking to get something from people or we're expecting something as opposed to just appreciating. And perhaps when and you were talking about being with your father, that was the same idea. You were not there as a daughter in the presence of your father expecting something from him. You were there just open. Yeah, he wants his funeral. He has planned everything. Um, so he doesn't want to have any annunciation in the newspaper, mm -hmm. nothing, just um, very close family. And I said to him, you know what, it's it's my way of um, putting it into the newspaper um, yes. and uh, letting other people know what happened. It's my way of mourning. So I, in this case, I don't agree with you. And... Mm -hmm. In in earlier times, he would have said, oh, shut up, I do it my way. Mm -hmm. And now yeah. he said, okay, um, so maybe we have to reorganize it. So that was something new. He listened to my wish. That was yeah, excellent, to be honest. <laughs> well, the funeral is more or less for the living. And I think that's there should be at least a balance between the respects of those that are dying, the deceased, and the respects of those who are remaining behind because mm -hmm. you need some consolation. You need some kind of manner or way to process the death. And I feel like a funeral is, is part of that process. It's a very beautiful ceremony. People have an opportunity to talk and to remember, to appreciate. And to to rob us of that opportunity, I think, is unfair because you, the deceased, have passed on, and where you go, we don't know. But in the meantime, we have to basically embrace this this hole in our life and understand it, look at it, and then move on from it. And the you know, more we ignore that, it's painful. We, we... Yeah. Go on. Um, my first husband, well, I only had two, but anyway, my first husband mm -hmm. and I, uh, made an appointment after life on Jersey okay. Channel Islands, and um, mm -hmm. he would be a bird, and I would be another bird, and we even said which gesture we would do to recognize each other, and uh, that was somehow mm, uh, relaxing for me. Yes, it was like mm -hmm. oh, that's a nice nice idea, and now we are divorced, so. I don't know what to do, <laughs> where to go after after death. <laughs> I haven't made another appointment yet, so maybe I go to Jersey. Well, it's I I, I firmly believe that when the, when the, the deceased passed over, they will find a way to say one final goodbye to us. Certain dreams we have, they say that when someone passes over and you dream of them, and it's a very lucid and a very clear dream. That's them in spirit. And I feel like I have seen my open in my dreams and very lucid. So in many ways, I don't feel like I have ever really truly said goodbye. I feel like goodbye it doesn't really help me understand death. It's just a kind of word we say because Borea said that, you know, we just play at living and dying because we're immortal. But I do believe in my mother's experience this where she's had friends that have passed over and she's dreamt of them and seen them in a very lucid context. I think we are more human with death than with life. So we allow ourselves to go into the wrong direction. So like dreaming of people, not being sure about it, um, mm -hmm. forgetting it and dreaming again. But in life, we do things and then we decide, oh, that person is not good for us. So we say goodbye to that person. But with mm -hmm. death... We repeat and we try again and again because that is the mystique of it. So sometimes uh, I believe we should care more about the living than the dead. I, tr I agree. I, I, I think a fear of death is a fear of life. And I think being obsessed with death itself and the fear of it, 
it means I don't think you're having a conversation about it in your life. It means I think you're ignoring it for something superficial that in many ways carries you away into a distraction. Yes. So I, I, I think I'm sorry. No, I, I, I really didn't know what else I wanted to say. So please you <laughs> carry on. I'll be honest. So, I don't know. I always said that I'm not afraid of death, but I am. So it is interesting to see. So how about you, Rob? I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of not fulfilling what I need to do in this life before dying. Okay. To me, dying is, it's, it's natural. It's, it's, it's like, again, putting on new clothes or, you know, stepping outside. It's just a different stepping out. So I don't look at death with fearful. I just, I'm concerned about the work I need to do here before. It is basically be the same idea of like fearing, you know, having a job and not being able to complete your tasks before the, the, you know, your boss says you're fired or you have to retire. Okay. That's so now I, I, I have to tell you that you are not fired. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, good. Uh, time is up. Ah, uh, but say. before we go, uh, before we go, I'd like to read this poem because it has this context because of the character of Anna, who we began the episode with. And she later becomes a nurse. And mm -hmm. I was always fascinated with my, my stepsister. She was a nurse and she talked a lot about how she was often present at the moment of people's passing and how that mm -hmm. had an impact on her, how she felt mm -hmm. quite honored that they waited for her to enter the room before passing over. And in the context of this poem, it's in a larger collection that I've worked on where she's fallen in love with an Austrian man and it's a moment in Italy and things don't work out. So this is, her words to him, but her reflection on life and death mm -hmm. in the wake of their relationship. So I would like to read that in closing. And it is a longer poem, but I, I feel it covers a lot of the topics that we've talked about. So, mm -hmm. so it's called Anna to her former lover. Anton, somehow, seemingly, I get the impression we never loved. Those beaches, sunset lulled, instances are, instances are rediscovered. Memory half tingles with the truth in my fingertips. In this spine, a magic fade long down my legs, remnants. Shallow voids filled my palms that accepted every trace of our touch to be left with this illness of questions. I am left with returning to work, my meeting with the dying, house to house, morning to morning. Soul passes on in the night, not like before, when I come, when I came upon curtains. I was the one who closed them, fingers, to a former pulse, a nodding. Then when I watched my hand switch off machines, I would sit there, last prayers, fingers and lids tight, hopefully guiding them. There is no grief, only this continuing continuum of time that for me is no longer marked by your hands, sun softened with kisses. Other night I went out with friends, couples, streets, rain, and red and white, a black straw dropped down into my drink, while I alone trying to enter and endure drifts of discussion. Our friend, in her breaking up, out on the patio beyond the din of the band I saw through the pain, cell phone to red-pressed ear, dramatic grief, sympathetic faces for the one doing the dumping, a kind of death, right? Leaves falling, scouring the street. I no longer have such expressions. Winds are whispering autumn. Trees shiver orange and half-naked in city lights. Shadows, headlights, a traffic signal waving me on waving down, then cracked in rain, almost beautiful, the amber sparkle on drying roads. I hear the keys chime vacantly in the porcelain bowl by the door, and hear my lines, as if I could deny another world or life, to feel its desperate, belated, and languid trail, to choke the neck of those hours, hand to neck, notepad and pen, between these words, regrets wading in with those olives and wines we shared, those nights and wanderings my straw hat lost, beach scented, Wine wanted and languid in our world, climbing stairs, there's light, darkness, and careless light. And when I cannot write any more, the slow solitude pushes the gall, a routine, still a little unprepared for being back up at night. Yes, arms yearning to be reached for, my knees, cheek huddled against empty bone. How can everything be released untouched, skin, a shrouded barrier that offers no entrance to fade of my tan? An inconsolable beating of the clock, the fading, perceives only me. You didn't come through, but blank lovers overlap a sigh that mistook those hours. To be here and in last night, dream nudged, hands onto the nightstand, my fingernail to the nick on the drawer that wasn't even there, and here wine, and the bountiful bulb of my glass turning around in my rooms, 
to see a kind of mistake, a mistake in whatever I'm doing now. Pillows, briefly blue and yellow, a longing, your Zainzusht, succinct, briefly, barely flesh, red and taglio on your cheek, my hand, to cross over and return. Do you know how bare it all feels? I feel on my shoulder something so f fulfilling. I wear the mantle of what I love doing, but I cannot come home to myself without wanting to sink in front of the couch, to drink in front of my laptop, music on the media player, one glass more weighing out its effects like a spectator. I'm not myself, but something deeper looking out, looking up, for in everything I feel there's an encasement, fleshly enclosure. There will be this skin and thoughts, instances, hand to my forehead, eyes closed to remember mouths open, a lover living on beyond the echo of my voice. Others too are faint as I am, a shadow to them. Where do these thoughts come from? I don't know, Anton, but they come alone, alone with morning blue streets, silver slivers of cold rain, a day of duties, eyes diluted, that continue wrinkled departures and breath, messages of lost life where machines and loved ones cannot go. At night, reprieve to the gym, running the track, swimming in the pool, and the water immersed endlessly on my own. Even if the bodies of others create wakes, ebb against mine, their nearness of vibration, I am my own entrance and exit. The solitude behind every fractured facade is a black space. It is there, waving against mine, swimmers and auras, the borders, nothing but myself, completing my pleasures, routines, motions. In this pool, I again watch the faces, Conjuring them up from the day, the ones gone before me, the ones who are going, leaving this earthly plane where our lives are coiled around the hopes for each other. Released they are released, lids, lips, still these faces like relieved cups, not even the bare trace of how lashes once lashed and mouths move with words. All our attempts to hold our frail words against the moment. But in the pool floating, I look up, arms heavy, goggles on my forehead, seeing myself, reflected against the pool's glass skylight, my figure wedded to black sky. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very nice. Yes. yes and again, uh, with the wind. <laughs> a what? With the wind. It oh. is in it. The element. Always. Oh, the wind? Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't notice that, so. <laughs> <laughs> But... Yes, thank you very much for listening, viewing, whatever, whatever you may be in, however you may be enjoying this. Yeah. Until next See time. Next so, week. what what will be the theme next week, or should we just keep it as a surprise? Love. Well, love. Ooh, that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. From death to love. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Dolly. This has been absolutely wonderful. Great talking with you. Thank you, and see you. And look look forward to future episodes. <laughs> All the best. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye.